Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you, sit, you were able to brave the first snow of the year. Uh, I, for one, by the way, I'm just going to confess, three plus years in San Antonio, I'm pretty happy to have the snow. <laughs> But some, for some of you, this, that may have brought major day. For some of you, it may have wrecked your day. But at any rate, this is the day that the Lord has made. And so let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am Chaplain Eric Tischer. I'm your chaplain this morning. I'd invite you to please stand with me and let us sing together. Bless his holy name. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Yes, he has. Oh, Lord, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Life that has been reborn 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For this morning's scripture reading, we read from the 46th Psalm, verses 1 through 7. God is our refuge yes, and strength. Yes, yes. Hmm. Trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, an ending love, Lord, amazing grace. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me below will be forever mine. 
will be forever mine. Lord, you are. You are forever mine. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Let us go before our God in prayer. Oh Lord, as we come before you today, as your people assembled in your name, we recognize that you are in your holy temple, that your throne is in heaven, that your eyelids see and test the children of man. We have seen the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we pray that by your Spirit, our love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that we may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. We lift up those who are unable to join us today in person, that you would supply every need of theirs in accordance with your riches and glory. We also lift up to you our leaders at the federal, state, and local levels. We know that there is no authority except from God, and that those that exist have been instituted by God, Though our nation may be politically divided, may we be a people who, as far as it depends on us, live peaceably with all. We also pray that regardless of the outcome of the called races and the races yet to be called, we will pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Let this season be your church's finest hour as we demonstrate the hope laid up for us in heaven. We pray this, praying the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Again, it's good to see each and every one of you here today. In the way of announcements, in, in a couple moments, we'll be taking up our offering. Uh, this morning's offering is a designated offering. We'll be uh, giving that offering to the, the Ogden Rescue Mission. I, I had the privilege of meeting the director of the Ogden Rescue Mission uh, this past week. And, and uh, they're coming up on a season where they have a lot of demands. Uh, of course, it's never a good time to be homeless. It's never a good time to be hungry, so they have demands year-round. So uh, be advised that today's offering is a designated uh, offering. In the way of other announcements, uh, we have on the back sheet our, our regular events for the week. And uh, with those, a reminder, Wednesday is a federal holiday. It is going to be Veterans Day. So for those of you that are veterans, happy Veterans Day early. For those of you that, that will be veterans someday, happy Veterans Day to you in advance. For those of you that are, are married or family members of veterans, happy Veterans Day to you as well. I encourage you to go online and find out some free loot that you can get and enjoy your day. But with that, uh, Wednesday activities are canceled, as is our tradition on on federal holidays, but certainly uh, keep be advised of those events like uh, like the women's Bible study, the adult Bible study, the singles Bible study in Awana. They happen throughout the week. So with that, at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our offering.
If you have a Bible near you, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 6 is where we'll be at. We'll be taking a look at verses 1 through 8 there in Micah chapter 6. As you're turning there, I'd like to remind each and every one of you, in case you're not tracking, it's 47 days until Christmas. For some of you, this realization may have induced joy within your heart. It's been a long year, and we need some celebration, right? For others, this realization may have brought on anxiety, panic, even. Of all the thoughts you have to do for everything you have to do to get ready for Christmas. If we're all honest with each other, though, this Christmas will probably look very different from past years. The pandemic will no doubt subdue some of our celebrations. And if we're not careful, these differences may produce in us a joy-robbing disappointment. Because of this, it's important for us to guard our hearts and to manage our expectations. That said, will the differences in this Christmas necessarily all be a bad thing? And can we play an active role in ensuring that we truly celebrate Christmas this year? I ask this because as a pastor and as a chaplain, I've seen the aftermath of the holiday seasons at work in many who suffer from the post-holiday blues. Usually, these post-holiday blues are fueled by disappointment over unmet expectations, as well as by exhaustion from getting caught in the funnel cloud of chaos that is often characteristic of the holidays. If so, many people, if, if so many people, though, suffer from those post-holiday blues, then perhaps the pandemic is not the problem. Perhaps the problem lies in the way that we celebrate Christmas and in our unwillingness to let go of traditions that no longer bring us the joy they once did. In this morning's scripture reading, we encounter a people who are finding that their traditions no longer seem to work for them. And because the traditions no longer seem to work for them, they start integrating traditions that even the Lord never commanded them to integrate. But as a response, the prophet Micah provides a diagnosis of the problem, and then he prescribes a cure in Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How I've how wearied you. Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, advised him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what is does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? May God add his blessing to the hearing and doing of his word. Amen. A little background on the book of Micah. 
Micah was a prophet about the 8th century, around the 8th century. He was a contemporary to the prophet Isaiah. During his time as prophet, Israel, the northern kingdom, collapsed and its people were taken to Nineveh as exiles. Judah, the southern kingdom, was spared such a fate. However, they were under regular attack as well, and they would succumb to the Chaldeans only roughly 120 years later. The book of Micah can be divided into three distinct prophetic messages, each one carrying with it a message of judgment and a message of hope. In chapter 6, where we pick up today, we see the beginning of Micah's third prophetic message. By this time, the political entity of Israel had fallen, and so only Judah remained, though as we noted in the scripture, uh, the Lord still refers to Israel because he's referring to the people, not so much the political entity. But just what was the issue there? The issue was that God's people were continuing to offer the sacrifices, offerings, and observe the holy days that the Lord commanded them to observe. But despite their commitment to ritual, the hearts of the people were not in the practice. There was no inward commitment, no inward change, just external appearances. And these external appearances, appearances were reflected by the fact that the people failed to treat their neighbors in a manner befitting of the people of God. Worse yet, they'd started to incorporate the practices of other religions into their own practice to include human sacrifice, something the Lord never commanded them to do. So the Lord sent Micah to call them away from their practices and back to a right relationship with God. In verses 1 through 2, the Lord calls the mountains as witnesses to a dispute between him and his people uh, in, what, in what is the picture of a great court trial. In verses 3 through 5, God complains that the people are guilty of a breach of contract. Later, in verses 9 through 16, he specifically calls them out for violence, deception, and for crooked business practices. Again, conduct not becoming of the people of God. In verses 6 through 7, Micah brings up the expected protest of the people. The people had kept the rituals of their ancestors. He brings up this protest only to voice the Lord's rebuttal in verse 8. His rebuttal that the people had missed the point. They thought that keeping the rituals and checking the right boxes meant that they had a healthy relationship with God. Yet they did not have that healthy relationship with God. Which was why the nation was in such terminal, turmoil at the time. Now, Jesus had the same challenge to confront in his day. The reason he was so harsh on the religious leaders was that they taught the people that only the rituals mattered and how you lived out your faith did not matter. In Matthew 23, Jesus confronts the scribes and Pharisees with seven woes. Each one of these woes addresses the tendency of the religious elite to not only ignore human needs around them, but to manipulate the law to further their own self-interests. Verses 27 through 28 provide a good summary of this situation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but are within, within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you are also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so the people of Jesus' day were guilty of the same offenses of the people of Micah's day. The offense of checking all the right religious boxes without applying the principles behind the rituals. Their religion had become nothing more than pointless ritual. 
Now that brings us to our day. It's easy for us to sit back and say, well, that, that could never happen to me. I've got a real relationship with God. I have faith. I've accepted Christ. I, the Holy Spirit has sealed me for the day of redemption. And that's all that matters. I'm good. Such thinking is a trap. The fact is, even though we no longer live under a system of animal sacrifices and prescribed legal requirements does not mean we're just good to go to live whatever life we wish to live. James, in speaking against this mindset, declared to his hearers, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, justification is by faith alone. But true faith reveals itself through the way we live our lives. For many years, within many circles, there was, there was talk about the difference in accepting Jesus as your Savior and accepting Jesus as your Lord, but yet Scripture makes no such distinction. To call Jesus your Savior is to call Him Lord, and to call Him Lord is to do what He says. You see, Micah's point here was this. Pointless ritual does not result in a life that glorifies God. The people of his day did not bring glory to God by keeping sacrifices while neglecting the weightier matters of the law. Nor do we. When we view our religion as nothing more than a box to be checked, we too miss the point. Micah's diagnosis, apart from a true commitment to live a life that glorifies God, ritual is pointless. So that was, the, that was the diagnosis. Now what is the cure? The cure for that pointless ritual is this. Purposeful response. In verse 8, the prophet Micah gives the people of Judah the cure to their ills. And the cure to their ills is nothing new. He doesn't give them anything new here. He just really rephrases it. Let us remember what the Lord said to the Israelites through Moses. In the desert, on Mount Sinai, in Exodus 20, after the Lord had rescued the Israelites from the tyranny of Egyptian slavery, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And what follows are probably very familiar to you. The Ten Commandments. The summary of God's holy law and the revealer of God's holy character. Historians tell us that the beginning of Exodus 20 takes the form of the treaties that were made at the time between uh, the conquering nations. The treaties that they would make with the nations that they had conquered. In those treaties, the conquered people would be granted certain rights and privileges. And these rights and privileges would be based upon the treaty between the two parties. Earlier in my message, I mentioned that Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, takes the form of a court case. One where God is accusing the people of Judah of a breach of contract. The contract, or better defined, the covenant, is the one the Lord made with his people there on Mount Sinai. The 613 regulations we find in the Law of Moses are an application of the Ten Commandments. They were designed to ensure that the Israelites did not violate the covenant they had with the Lord. In Micah chapter 6, the prophet, in essence, takes the Ten Commandments and summarizes them into three basic actions that if the people of Judah would just do them, they would live by them. First, he tells the people to do justice. Joseph Benson, in his commentary on this verse, declares that to do justly is to render to all their dues, to superiors, equals, inferiors, to be true and just to all, and to oppress none in their person's property or reputation. In our dealings with others, to carry a chancery in our own breasts 
and to act according to equity. The term justice gets thrown around a lot today in the news and on social media, particularly given much of the social upheaval that has taken place in our country lately. Now, for many, social justice has become the clarion call of our time. Now, time does not permit us to take a deep dive into the demands of social justice and of the critical theories undergirding many of those movements. I'll encourage each of us, though, to put into practice 1 Thessalonians 5.21, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Test everything you hear against Scripture. Also be reminded of the words of James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. Theoretical frameworks not based on scripture, are fatally flawed. Let let me challenge us all with this. If the world right now is looking to sociologists for the answer to the injustice problem, is it because God's people have failed to understand and to uphold the standards of biblical justice within our own ranks? Is it because we've lost our saltiness Now, by the way, I have a degree in sociology, so I understand sociology. And sociology can be a useful tool for describing behavior, but sociology does not prescribe behavior. Here's the prescription right here. This is your prescription. For you maintainers, here's your technical orders. The Bible prescribes behavior, not sociology. The demands of biblical justice are far higher than those of social justice, and these are the demands to which we must submit. Do justice. Second, Micah tells his people to love kindness. The word there translated in the in the ESV, which is what I read from, kindness, translated mercy in some other translations, is best translated, rather, steadfast love. And the steadfast love of the Lord is unfathomable from this side of heaven. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God demonstrated to us his steadfast love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans tells us that nothing can ever separate us from that love. This is the love which we have been shown. And though we continue to fall short of that level of love, and will continue until the resurrection, we as God's redeemed are to strive to show others that steadfast love. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is anointed by a woman who is described as a woman of the city who was a sinner. When the Pharisees object to the woman anointing Jesus, Jesus tells a parable. And then he reminds them that the woman loves much because she's been forgiven much. We too will show that steadfast love spoken of here in Micah when we remember that we too have been forgiven much. Love kindness. Third, Micah tells the people to walk humbly with God. Albert Barnes, in his commentary on this verse, declares it is not a crouching before God 
displeased, but a hum- the humble love of the forgiven. Walk humbly as the creature with the creator, but in love with thine own God. Humble thyself with God, who humbled himself in the flesh. Walk on with him, who is thy way. Neither humility nor obedience alone would be true graces, but to cleave fast to God, because he is thine all, and to bow thyself down, because thou art nothing, and thine all is he, and of him. We have the perfect example of humility in Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because Jesus humbled himself for us. Our reasonable act of service is to walk humbly with him. Walk humbly. Do these three things, says Micah, and you will do that which is good and what the Lord requires. The whole law summarized in three statements right there. Later, Jesus then summarizes the whole law into two statements. In Matthew 22, a Pharisee asks Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If we are fulfilling these two greatest commandments, we are fulfilling the whole of God's requirements. In so doing, we find a cure for our pointless ritual in a purposeful response to God as we return to the basics of our faith. The cure for pointless ritual, a purposeful response. As we conclude our look at Micah, I want for us to ponder this question. Have the holidays brought us peace and joy, or have they brought us anxiety and disappointment? If we look back at past years and we answer the latter, then it's time for us to return to the basics, to put into practice a purposeful response. After all, we're celebrating the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We are celebrating the birth of our Savior. If, after the new year, we can look back on this holiday season and say, I celebrated the birth of Jesus this year. I worshiped our Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith. Then you can say with confidence that this Christmas was a great Christmas. The pandemic doesn't matter because as you have returned to the basics of your faith, you have found Jesus in the midst of the chaos. I want to put this challenge out to us here this morning. Much as Micah did to the people of Judah and Israel in his day, to examine ourselves. Have our rituals become little more than boxes to check? Have they lost their meaning? Have we found ourselves chasing excitement in things that are not of God, all in the name of God? If so, it's time for us to repent of such pointless ritual, to turn back to Christ, and to have the purposeful resolve to worship him and him only this holiday season. As we do so, it will begin to look a lot like Christmas. In a few moments, we're going to gather together, partake of the Lord's table. And as we do so, we recognize that all three elements of Micah's 
summary are present here in the communion. When we partake of the communion in a worthy manner, that is, as ones who have repented and confessed that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God has risen him from the dead, when we take of the communion in that manner, we do justly. As we are reminded in Hebrews chapter 9, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes just judgment. So Christ, having offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. We also show that we love mercy. As Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but you are now God's people. Once you had, received, had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. But then third, we also show humility. As Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 5, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Jonathan Edwards once said, You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. And when we keep these things in mind, we observe the communion in a right manner. And so with these truths in mind, let us humbly bow and prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's table. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have not left us groping in darkness, trying to figure out our own way. But Lord, You've revealed to us, Lord Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to God except through you. Now, Lord, as we confess with our mouths that you are Lord and believe in our hearts that you have risen, uh, that the Father has risen Jesus from the dead, and, and we claim our salvation, we recognize that there are that we still sin in many ways, but you tell us that if we confess our sins, we're, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. So at this time we confess that we truly are sinful and that we rely solely on you. Now Lord, as we take of the communion, we pray that we will do so, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. I ask our ushers to come forward.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let us take of the cup and I invite you to stand with me I pray that each and every one of you has a blessed week. I pray that you remember who you are. I pray that you remember whose you are. I pray that you remember whose name you bear. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. Now may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Christ, we pray these things. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Go in peace. Amen.